everyone. We're going to start promptly at 7, so we have plenty of time. My name is Jane Purinananda, and I'm on the SIAM series uh, lecture committee. So first of all, I, I would like to announce a few programs that we have coming up this month. On Saturday, the 7th of March, at 2.30, there will be a talk in Thai about the Sikara and the Vimana in Indian art and the influences in Southeast Asia by Dr. Cheda Tangsan Jali. On the 19th of March, there will be a Thursday evening, 7 o'clock, a lecture, Buddhism, Whiteness, and the Indian Institution of Caste by Frank Hoffman. There's going to be a very interesting exhibit on the 21st of March. Uh, it's an exhibit of textiles of pra, uh, Pa Pravet. Those are the painted v Visantra Jataka scrolls. And it's a private collection by Mumlung Pawani Sukhavasti Santi Siri. Uh, and so that will be taking place from 1.30 to 4, uh, 4 p.m. On, on Saturday, the 21st. And finally, there's going to be a talk on Thursday, the 26th of March, the Pimai Heritage Trust and the Voice of Voiceless People by Rungsumi Gulapat. So keep those in mind. This evening, we are going to enjoy hearing a talk entitled Pictorial Tour of Thailand movie, Thailand's Movie Theaters. I first learned about Philip Jablong's efforts to document Thai movie theaters a few years ago when I heard he had received a grant from the James H. W. Thompson Foundation. When I learned about his project, it made me think about movie theaters in a different way. I have wonderful memories from my childhood enjoying films and popcorn at the little local movie theaters in small towns in the United States, which probably no longer exist. When I think of these movie theaters, I realize they represented much more than just a place. They were part of our culture and lifestyle, pre-DVD, pre-Netflix, pre-downloads. The same is true for Thailand, where, more, where movie theaters became popular social venues for, that have had an impact on a changing society. While in many people's minds, cultural preservation relates to ancient or historic monuments, we forget that certain places that have come and gone in our own lifetime are also important reminders of a different social structure and cultural era. Cultural era. So this evening it gives me um, pleasure to look forward to learning more about this topic from Philip Jablon. He has a degree in Asian studies from, the, from Temple University and he also studied at Chiang Mai University. His project documenting standalone movie theaters in Thailand began in 2009 after coming across an old theater in Chiang Mai only to find a few months later that it had been demolished. He has photographed and documented old standalone theaters in Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, and even a few in Cambodia and Vietnam. His work has been shown at various international exhibits and his book, which is downstairs, uh, and you can buy one, uh, Thailand's Movie Theaters, Relics, Ruins, and the Romance of Escape was published in 2019. So, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you all for coming out here tonight. This is the second time I've spoken here. The first time was a, uh, sorry, Let's see if I can do this without messing things up. The first time I spoke here was in 2015, I believe 2015, the day after um, the Erawan Shrine bombing, and Thailand was very quiet, and I expected no one to come out, but lo and behold, we had an almost packed house. And this time around, well, we have obviously this uh, virus which is apparently going around, and yet you've still all decided to come out and uh, brave this to hear me speak. So I thank you all for coming very much, and I thank the uh, CM Society for having me. Um, I'll do away with uh, the uh, larger introductions. Uh, Jane very nicely summed up what I've been doing, and I'll just get right into it. I'm basically going to try and run through a brief and abridged history of Thailand's movie theaters through various eras, uh, looking at their architecture and how that um, developed based on various 
uh, political, economic, and social uh, um, epochs. So without further ado, and I'll shamelessly uh, promote my book. If you'd like to buy a copy, they're downstairs on sale for 100 baht off the cover price, 900 baht. So Thailand has actually a very long and illustrious history of film and cinema going. Uh, the first film to show in Thailand was screened, I believe, in 1897. Uh, and it was... Uh, screened by a representative of the Lumiere brothers from uh, France. They were traveling around Southeast Asia with uh, this new invention, motion picture, and Bangkok was one of their stopping places. Uh, in the, Thailand did not, however, get its first movie theater until 1905, and that was a uh, wooden structure down in the Ratanakosin area, developed by a Japanese entrepreneur by the name of uh, Watanabe Torotomi, and it became known as the Japanese cinema, based on the fact that, well, the, the first person to bring this technology and this type of building into the country was from Japan. Uh, it was a wooden structure, as were almost all of the early movie theaters, like this one. Uh, they were, to our modern sensibilities, you might think they are very uh, primitive, uh, very simple structures, not your typical palatial movie palace, or of course, nothing like the multiplexes we have now. But for the time, they were grand affairs. They were generally built of teak wood or whatever other available uh, hardwoods could be found in the market. This is one such example from, uh, from Pechabun province. But around the country, these buildings existed, um, like this one in Songkla, which is actually still standing the Saha Cinema. The Saha Cinema Company was one of the early cinema companies. It was owned by the Crown Property Bureau, and uh, they had branches mostly throughout Bangkok, but in, in a few of the provinces as well. Um, this movie, Kelly's Heroes, uh, came to Thailand, I guess, in 1971. Just out of curiosity, does anybody know who these uh, figures are? Does anyone know who that is? That's right, Telly Savalas, and that? Donald Sutherland, correct, and that? That's right, that's Clint Eastwood, and the last one? Stan Rickles. <laughs> so, this, uh, the paintings that used to adorn movie theaters were very grand affairs, as you could see, and some of the top artists in the land got their start and or earned the majority of their income by painting these types of advertisements. Uh, this is the same theater as it stands now in Song Klai. It's a parking garage. You can still see a little bit of the sign up there. But uh, yeah, it's kind of sad, but nonetheless one of the few remaining wooden pre-World War II theaters, built in 1923 if my memory serves correct. The most famous of these old, these original wooden cinemas that's still among us is right here in Bangkok. It's the uh, Salachalam Thani Theater. It's in the Nang Leung Market, uh, which is just near the uh, Sapan Khao area of Bangkok in Ratanakosin. It was built in 1918, uh, originally called the Nang Leung Cinema. The builder was a guy by the name of Mr. Xiao. Mr. Xiao was actually a Malay Chinese from the, uh, the Strait Settlements who moved to Bangkok to start a theater chain. And he basically created the largest movie theater chain and empire, the first movie theater empire in the country. Uh, his theaters had such names as the Penang, the Singapore, uh, the Hong Kong, and this one, the Nang Le, and there was a number of others as well. Eventually, the Xiao, Xiao's Siam Cinema Company was bought out by the Saha Cinema Company. And, uh, all the names were changed to the more common, more recent titles of Salah Chalom. This was added to the, uh, the front of the name. So this became the Salah Chalom Tani. This, the Singapore theater became the Salah Chalom Buli. Um, the Penang became the Salah Chalom Mat, if I'm not mistaken, and so on and so forth. 
So this is basically what the uh, early movie theaters were like. Now, there's actually some interesting news about this one in particular. After sitting vacant for about 20 years, uh, a few years ago there was a, uh, a movement to try and renovate it and revive it, led by the Thai Film Archive, um, and which has been successful. They lobbied the owner, which is the Crown Property Bureau, to invest some funds into it and turn it back into an active cinema and uh, living museum. And this is what it's due to become, I guess, any day now. It should be close to finished. So again, the early movie theaters look like this. The later ones, the first movie theater that you might call a movie palace in Thailand was this one, the Salachalam Krung. Uh, this came about in 1933. It was the brainchild of King Rama VII, and it was built in celebration of the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Chakri dynasty in Bangkok. So it was due to open in 1932, but due to some over budget um, situations and uh, I imagine the Great Depression, which was in full effect at the time, didn't open until 1933. Anyhow, this set the stage for movie theaters in Thailand to come. It was the first modern uh, public building that, um, in Bangkok really, as far as I know. It's also the first building in the country to have air conditioning, the first public building that is. Um, it screened films regularly up until about 15, 20 years ago, then it went out of business, uh, and it's since been turned into a, uh, the, the Khon Theater of Thailand. Uh, this is a, some pictures of the lobby. Uh, again, this kind of modern Art Deco style, which was all the rage in Southeast Asia at the time, uh, in mint condition to this day. Unfortunately, it doesn't show movies anymore, or very seldom. Uh, so, though it is still the oldest and oldest of the grand movie theaters in Thailand, I have trouble considering it a movie theater in this day and age because it's completely lost that reputation. There's an old movie theater ticket. Again, the architecture of these buildings was, uh, it was something of, a thing of pride. Um, as you can see, all the old theater tickets, or many of them, would have a rendering of the theater on it. And when I, when I see these things, and you know, it wasn't just movie theaters that did this, most kinds of businesses in the early 20th century and late 19th century were very proud of their architecture. It was very much a sort of a, a brand. So with movie theaters, it was the same thing. And you see these beautiful old tickets. The Odeon was one of the top Chinese language cinemas in Bangkok, in the, in the Chinatown area. The Broadway, also in Chinatown. Uh, by the 1960s, the Broadway had become the show house of Japanese cinema. Whenever a Japanese movie would come to Bangkok, it would get its premiere either at the Broadway or another one, the Capitol Theater, which is a little further up on Jeroen Krung Road. Uh, the Empire at Bak Klong Talat. Uh, this facade is actually still in, existing, still in existence. So I'm, I'm a big fan of these. There's the Capitol. The Hollywood Theater was one of the staples of, uh, I guess, the Payatai area until the, I want to say, early 1990s. It's no longer there. In Chiang Mai, we had... Uh, a small chain owned by one of the local lords, Zhao Chai Suliwong Na Chiang Mai, uh, who owned the Suliwong, the Suliyong, the Suriya, and the Sanctawan Theater. Moving forward in time, we get to the 1940s and World War II. Thailand, now under the control of Pibun Songkram, uh, there's not much going on in terms of the construction of movie theaters in this era. Uh, this goes for the entire world, not just Thailand. However, in Thailand, Pibun's government uh, is building a few movie theaters, um, mainly to screen movies that are going to propagate a government message. 
this one is in Lopbori. It's called the Tahanbok Theater, built in 1941. So the Army Theater. Uh, soldiers at the local military base were allowed to watch movies for free at the Tahanbok Theater on the weekends only. In nearby um, Utai Tani, another theater was built in 1943, also by Pibun's regime. This is the new Chalom Utai. To this day, the theater is standing in the middle of the old market. It's actually an interesting story. On this, this ground uh, originally held a temple. However, there is a fire in the temple, and under P. Boone's government, they built a movie theater on it. The land, however, is still owned by the Department of Religions. So this theater is technically owned by the Department of Religions. Sadly, it's sitting there uh, disused and decaying. The most famous of the theaters built by people in Songkram, however, was one of the early public-private partnerships in the country, the Salachalam Thai Theater, which is built at the head of Ratchadam Nern Road. Um, I, I've, I only started coming into Thailand in 2002, so the Salachalam Thai was long gone by the time I got here. But by all accounts, this was indeed Thailand's grandest ever movie theater. Uh, very palatial inside, extremely ornate, and it gained the reputation uh, as the premier cinema for all major Thai and Hollywood films. If it was the top movie around, if it was the biggest blockbuster, this is where it would show first. The, uh, so the public side was the government, and the private side was a guy by the name of Mr. Pisit Tansacha, who, this was his first movie theater venture. He later went on to establish the Pyramid Theater chain, which later became known as Apex. You might know Apex now for its one remaining movie theater, um, the Scala. But at one time, Apex was the biggest theater chain in Thailand. They had the most screens, they had the largest distribution network, and they tended to get the premier movies from the West as well as Thailand, but mainly the West. Uh, so yeah, this was one of the grandest movies. This was probably the grandest movie theater. I'm sure there's some people in here who can attest to that. Unfortunately, it was torn down, I think, in 1997 um, because the, the, the logic was that in the, um, the reconfiguration of Ratchadam Nern Road, a movie theater should not be blocking one of the most um, important temples in the country, important temple complexes. I can never remember the name of the temple complex, but it was behind the Salachalim Thai, and uh, they wanted to make it visible. It was very interesting in Bangkok if you look at how theaters developed. Theaters were actually part and parcel of the development of the city itself. And my main point of, uh, my main logic for this, for, for, for this theory, goes like this. So the old theaters, the original theaters, were built almost exclusively near the river, the Ratanakosin area, Salatilum Krung, the Salatilum Tani. As the city started to grow, and especially eastwards, uh, movie theaters became one of the major push-pull uh, ventures that would draw development. The Queen's Theatre is in Wang Burapa, which is though it's a quite an old area of, of Bangkok. Um, it, in the 1950s, it was the epicenter of basically youth culture. And that's because there's three theaters in the Wang Burapa area. There's the Queen's, there's the King, and there was the Grand. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the Queen, of the Kings, but there's the Queen, there's the Grand. And these, made, these theaters made the commercial and entertainment hub of Bangkok, the Wang Bulapa area. Uh, it's called, called the Wang Bulapa area, by the way, because there was a palace, the Bulapa Palace, which uh, stood on the land uh, for many years before these theaters were built. 
In the 19, during World War II, it was uh, taken over by the Japanese and used as some sort of headquarters, and eventually bombed by the Allies, which obviously that did away with it. The movie theaters are built in its place. So if you follow the trajectory of movie theater construction in, in Bangkok especially, you see you've got the old theaters near the river. Then you're moving a little further west to Wang Bulapa. The next big theater to be developed, which really pushed the city further west, was the Chalom Khet movie theater, which was also built in conjunction with uh, Pisit Tansa, and I believe it was uh, a, mem a prince. I can't remember his name, but... So this development pushed the city west. Fortunately, I don't have a picture of uh, the Shalom Kit, but mark my words, it was one of the grand ones. <clears throat> uh, so now we're moving forward in time. We've passed the 60s, now we're, get it, we're past the 50s, now we're getting into the 60s. And this is a very critical time in Thailand's movie theater history, because this is when movie theaters are beginning to be built all over the country, not just in the major markets, but in the minor markets, in tertiary cities in the north and northeast, which prior to the 1960s were very loosely connected to the rest of the country. Travel was difficult. Um, in the 1960s, uh, in, I believe in 1961, Thailand and the United States entered into a strategic military partnership and political partnership whereby the United States Air Force was granted access to Thailand, seven of Thailand's air bases. Money was coming into the country in large sums. Uh, uh, what are they called? Accelerated rural development programs were bringing the market economy into areas which were previously scarcely connected to it. Movie theaters were growing. Uh, at this point, you get this very famous film in Thailand, The Ugly American, which is uh, somewhat of a critique of uh, America's role in Southeast Asia at the time. Uh, uh, it wasn't a huge hit in the United States, as far as I know, but in Thailand it was quite popular. It premiered at the, as I said, the premier theater, the Salat Chalam Thai, and this was the beautiful hand-painted poster that was made for it. Uh, and although... The poster, the poster features the star, Marlon Brando, as well as King, um, Kukrit Pramot, the former prime minister. Uh, Kukrit has a very minor role in the movie, yet, as you can see, he's placed higher for the Thai audience in the poster than Marlon Brando, who was the big superstar. Uh, so yeah, in the American era, and this, this, this photo was actually sent to me by a U.S. serviceman who was based in Ubon. And this was him standing in front of one of the theaters in the town, the Chalom Sin. Uh, in this era, roughly in 1961, movie theaters are now being built all over the place. Here's, this is interesting. You can see also kind of change in, in, uh, in aesthetics of the time. So here's the Chalam Sin in its original guise, probably built after World War II with a somewhat Art Deco-y style. As we move into the 60s and mid-century modern architecture becomes more in vogue, they decided to modernize the theater and give it this look. They added this facade to it. Uh, in Thailand today, I would say in your average Thai city, the majority of the architecture you see was built in this era in the early 1960s through the early 80s. And you have a lot of stuff which is in this kind of mid-century style. Again, uh, moving, you see the development going forward. Here's the old sign, this little thing. And by the, the mid-60s, the key architectural the key piece of architectural language of the Thai movie theater is its dimensional signage. People often ask me this question, what's, what's unique about Thai movie theaters compared to, say, Burmese movie theaters or Vietnamese movie theaters or American movie theaters? Um, and my answer is always this, not a whole lot, at least not in terms of stuff from the 1960s and 70s. Generally, they were following modernist principles of architecture. 
However, what Thailand did much better than anybody else and distinguishes the architectural style is the signage. Thai movie theater signs were the absolute boldest signs you'll find anywhere. They were audacious almost. Uh, dimensional cutout signs that sat on the roof. And this you will see throughout almost all of rural Thailand and urban Thailand everywhere. This is the uh, Pha Mai Theater of Nan province. Again, a place that it had movie theaters prior to this, but they would have been very much wooden affairs, very simple structures. And by the 1960s, they're becoming these grand concrete modernist structures and uh, they're being built in, in profusion. Uh, in Pinsanalok, here's the Pinsanalok Rama. Again, there's this somewhat audacious sign. It's this one's not so much, but. Um. So when I started doing this project in 2012, this is basically what I was coming across. Theaters that were built in this boom era. The stuff from World War II, the really early stuff, the wooden pieces that I showed, the wooden uh, buildings that I showed you earlier, most of them had disappeared by this point. And what you're left with, what we're left with, is these giant boxy, concrete, somewhat brutalist, late stage international style buildings. Jumping back in time again. So we were talking about the development of Bangkok along through its movie theaters. And you have the Riverside ones, Wang Bulapa theaters, then the Chalam Khet, and the next big jump was Siam Square. And Siam Square was basically a squatter community in the 1960s, in the early 1960s. Uh, belonged to Chulalongkorn University. And the first major development in Siam Square was the aptly named Siam Theater. The Siam was built in 1966, and it was, again, it, uh, it kind of pushed the boundaries of technology and design, bringing Thailand's movie theater construction into the next phase. Um, it was the second building, not the first, I was corrected last time, the second building in Thailand to install escalators. The first one being the I believe it's the Daihatsu department store. It was a Japanese department store uh, very nearby. It was also the first theater in the country to install Cinerama projection technology. Cinerama, if you're not familiar with it, is, is basically the IMAX of today. Uh, you would have, or the IMAX of yesterday, sorry. You would have three projectors shooting film onto a curved screen simultane simultaneously, allowing for a much larger picture, a much more three-dimensional immersive experience, and it became the, the grand technology of the era for film, uh, film projection. So the Cinerama Theater, also built by Pisit Tan Sacha and the, uh, his Apex Theater chain, is the first in the country to install Cinerama and go forward a little bit. And this started off a bit of a wave, a Cinerama wave. Other theaters started doing this. If you wanted to be ahead of the curve, you needed to start installing Cinerama proje projection technology. So the Petrama Theater, which opened a few years later, they're now advertising Cinerama. And in fact, in the name itself, Rama, Pet, Diamond, Rama, a lot of people think, oh, it has to do with, uh, you know, Param, the, having to do with uh, the royal family. It actually has nothing to do with that at all. It is a way for movie theaters in Thailand to identify themselves as being cutting edge. We have Cinerama here, even though usually they didn't. I'm going to go forward. So here you go. This is in Sakeo, in far eastern Thailand. The Sakeo Rama. Uh, again, there was no Cinerama technology put in there, but the name you know, leads people to believe that this is the next stage of development in movie theaters. Uh, the Serum Suk, this is in Kumpawapi in um, uh, Udon Thani province in a small town. Didn't have the name Rama, but indicative of this 
era of architecture. The Bankerama on the outskirts of town also didn't have Cinerama uh, technology in involved. Uh, a little bit of a um, lewd, uh, lewd digression, if I may. When I photographed this theater, it was one of several active uh, porno theaters in the Bangkok area. And uh, I came over there and I set up my camera and I'm, you know, I want to take a picture of the theater. That's all I want to do. I have no interest in what's going on inside. Of course, immediately, uh, the manager comes running out and waves me away and says, no, get out of here. You can't show, you can't take pictures of this place. And I say to him, look, I, again, I, I'm not interested in what's going on inside. I just want to document the building. That's my only interest. I love old movie theaters and uh, this is why I'm here. So he gives me his consent, so I set up my camera and I'm taking pictures. And this is what I got. And only uh, when I come home and do a little photo editing do I realize that I actually caught somebody running out of the theater trying to avoid being photographed. But lo and behold, there he is forever immortalized. Um, the theater's now closed, it's been gutted, uh, it may even have been demolished, so I'm glad I pleaded my case with this manager and I'm glad he eventually consented. Uh, again, this is another, just, just another example of the types of buildings that were all over Thailand. This is in Bangsapannoi district in, uh, what province is this? Remind me, it's in Pachuapkirikan. A uh, very small, small district. And in the early 80s, they got their first standalone movie theater, and this was it. I want to go back a little bit to these beautiful posters because they kind of uh, intersect nicely with the era of the movie theater construction boom and the, the Rama movie theaters. In the early 1960s, Thai poster painters basically hatched a brand new style that would come to define this industry for the next 30 odd years. Um, the father of this style was a guy by the name of Piak Poster. His real name eludes me, but he went by the name of Piak Poster as his professional name. And he started uh, one of the first poster painting studios. They, were, they would be contracted to paint the large billboards, which would be festooned to the exteriors of the movie theaters and placed at important intersections around the city. And of course, they would also do the, the posters for that would be distributed to the movie theaters. Now, think of this era in, in Thai history. We're in the early 1960s, and uh, the market economy is beginning to spread. Movie theaters are opening up in places that previously didn't have movie theaters, that previously, uh, you know, very few people had access to this type of technology. You're also going into rural areas where people tend to have low education. Uh, many people are illiterate. So movie theater distributors who are sending their films up around the country are basically trying to market towards this pre-literate population or low literacy population. The best way to do that is not with a simple abstract design, but it's to go cut to the chase and show scenes that are actually in the movie. The most explosive scenes, the most violent, the most romantic, the most edgy. And this was what happened with uh, the Thai movie poster industry, or the Thai movie poster field, beginning in the 1960s. Um, if you were to compare this poster to the American version of Death Wish, you would see basically uh, Charles Bronson standing there with the gun. That's it. You would not see any of these other scenes in which there's all this nefarious stuff going on. So Thai movie posters have become, uh, in their own right, a very uh, collectible and sought-after thing. And here's a... Uh, Roger Moore's Moonraker 007 from 1985 or 86, I believe. Again, I, I should have dug up the, uh, the Western poster for this movie. It's the exact same design, except 
In the Thai version, they added all these little vignettes of scenes in the movie that you know, are designed to draw the, uh, the potential moviegoer's attention and interest. There's an interesting one. It's a documentary for a, a movie called Seven Days in Beijing, which uh, Kukrit Promote, who was prime minister, I guess, in 1975, after the United States normalized relations with mainland China, Kukrit Promote followed suit, goes to Beijing, meets Mr. Mao Zedong, cementing the Thai-Chinese uh, Thai relationship, and as we know, it's uh, in, in, in high mode right now. Well, maybe not right now, but for the last number of years. And here's the poster they made for it. Very lovely affair. Again, we go through the Ramas. This is in Mahachai, in uh, Sumutsakon province. Sili Panom Rama. This is one of the later eras of the standalone movie theater. Sili Panom is, uh, or Panom Salakan is the name of the town. It's in Chacheng Sao province. Um, here's another interesting tidbit about movie theaters in Thailand, which is somewhat unique. Almost everywhere you go, you find the owners of the movie theaters in Thailand tend to be, for lack of a better term, local bosses, uh, either political or economic or both. You find that they tend to own not just the movie theater, but they own, perhaps, if they're in a rural area, uh, a local rice mill or a sawmill or perhaps the market or maybe some hotels in the town. They tend to own, in some, the commercial infrastructure of the area. This is a little different from other places I've been in Southeast Asia where, yes, theater owners were, uh, you know, big people in the towns but they didn't tend to own the entire commercial infrastructure. This is, I think, quite unique to Thailand. Um, in Chiang Mai, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the Na Chiang Mai's, they built four movie theaters in the, in the town, Na Chiang Mai being one of the, the local royal household. They had built four theaters in the town. One of their biggest competitors was the Shinawat family. They owned three theaters in the town and another theater in Sankampeng. I was just in the city of Pitsanulok, where I was able to meet the owner of the Kitikon Cinema. After he was explaining to me the history of his movie theater and how he got into it, how he got in it, he then revealed that, yeah, I happened to also be the mayor of the town, and uh, my father owned many other businesses in the town, and so it's, it's a very unique kind of... Um, economic arrangement with movie theaters in Thailand. I, I mentioned that, that about this one in particular as uh, when I was doing my research here, local people told me, oh, this is owned by the local member of parliament. Uh, here's one of the very late stage standalone movie theaters, the Bang Pa In Rama in the little city of Bang Pa In just about an hour north from here in the southern part of Ayutthaya province. Um, it's very jarring to some people. I kind of think it's beautiful. Uh, I was, I originally described it as brutalist architecture, however, a Thai architect corrected me and uh, let it be known that, no, this is what be, would be called a late stage international style piece of architecture. And this is distinguished by the fact that the lower level still has a very light and airy look and looks as, if it looks as if it's kind of floating rather than a big bulky hunk of concrete, which most uh, brutalism is. Uh, so, yeah, this was built, I think, in 83. That's about when, they, when Thailand stopped developing standalone movie theaters and the multiplex was introduced. It was first introduced, actually not in Bangkok, not in Chiang Mai, but way out in eastern, in eastern Isan in the city of Ubon Ratchathani. And this was the Newada Cineplex. Uh, the Newada was actually the first multiplex movie theater in the country. Soon thereafter, uh, the movie theater 
owners in Bangkok picked up on this idea, realized that Bangkok, to run standalone movie theaters in Bangkok was becoming increasingly difficult because as traffic worsened in the 1980s and uh, traffic jams would snarl the city, people wanting to go see a movie at a specific time, at a specific standalone movie theater, would find themselves caught in gridlock, hence missing the start of the film, and people would stop going. In Bangkok, they very smartly figured out that if you build a shopping mall, add a movie theater to that, and built in parking, and allow the movie theater to be a multiplex, people have many choices, so if they miss the one movie that they're going to see, they now have other options to see, other movies that they can see. Uh, the first multiplex in Bangkok opened in, I believe it's 1994 or 95, out in Lat Prao, it, at central Lat Prao. Um, it was called the Thai Entertain Network Theater, the E, E Thai, Thai, no, Entertain Thai, E-T-N, Entertain Thailand Network. And it was the first, Bangkok's first multiplex movie theater in a shopping mall. It was established by the sons of another great movie theater mogul who built standalone movie theaters all across Bangkok. The family did actually. They were the Poon Wurlock family, uh, founded by Sia Jiang, or not Sia Jiang, Sia, J Sia Jalern, uh, Jalern Poon Wurlock, who founded the Go Brothers theater chain, which owned a sh chain of second run movie theaters in Bangkok and the Bangkok suburbs. They had the biggest second-run movie theater chain in Bangkok and Bank in Bangkok suburbs. However, they were not one of the top players. They were not on the level of, say, the Hollywood theater chain, which was which flagship, the flagship theater of which was the Hollywood Theater, or the Apex, Apex theater chain with Scala and Lido. Again, they were second-run theaters, uh, cheaper rates in the outlying areas. The next generation of the Poon Warlock starts, ETN. Later on, ETN partners with a Hong Kong-based cinema ex exhibitor and a Australian cin cinema exhibitor. So it becomes EVG, or EGV, I can't remember which order, but E for ETN, G for Golden Harvest, that's the Hong Kong partner, and V for Village Roadshow, that's the Australian partner. So EG, EGV Cinema, the first one to open is in Siam Discovery, if I'm not mistaken. Soon thereafter, another cinema ex exhibitor based in Eastern Thailand, uh, who runs a small chain of theaters based out of Trat province, the Saman Film Company. Uh, they move into Bangkok, into the Bangkok market, and they pen a deal to put a multiplex theater on the top floor of MBK, and that becomes SF Cinema. Uh, Saman Films, SF. That's where they come from, and they're from Eastern Thailand. Another branch of the Poon Waterlock family, they start Major Cineplex, their first standalone multiplex theater, they actually called it a standalone, is uh, Major Pinkeo. And from there, they start building an empire. Eventually, Major and EGV merge, I think Major bought EGV out. They're cousins, by the way, and they had a very strong rivalry. Um, and so then you've got this one, uh, this merged company, and you have SF Cinema. And they are now, to this day, competing for the movie market across the country, um, opening standalone chains uh, everywhere, really. They're going into tertiary markets now. It's not just the, the, the major cities or the secondary cities, it's all over. Uh, so Thailand now has a duopoly in terms of its movie theater uh, choices. There's some notable exceptions here in Bangkok, um, but by and large, 99% of the screens in Thailand are controlled by these two companies. Two of the few remaining standalone movie theaters that are still in operation are both strangely in, or oddly, in, in, uh, in the Isan region. One of them is the Det Udom Mini Theater. This is in the little tiny town of Det Udom, about a half an hour outside of Ubon Ratchatani. Uh, 
was built in the early, 90, early 2000s, I believe. It replaced an older wooden movie theater, and it's still going to this day. In fact, a few years ago, uh, after sharing this photo on one of my social media sites, the owner contacted me to let me know that, hey, we're still going strong. We just actually purchased digital projectors, uh, which is a very costly um, investment, and uh, we're still doing it. Even though I believe Major has also opened up a multiplex branch in the local Lotus shopping mall, so who knows how much longer these guys will be in business. The other operating standalone movie theater outside of Bangkok is this one, the Chumpe Cineplex, in a little district called Chumpe in uh, Konkan Province. Excuse me. Again, uh, this was built in the early 90s. Still in operation, as far as I know, and uh, yeah, these are the only two that are left. In Bangkok, there's one remaining standalone movie theater that's still in operation on a daily basis, and I'm sure you've all heard of it, and maybe most of you, hopefully most of you, have visited it at some point. It's the legendary Scala. This is Thailand's last movie palace, the last of the Mohicans, uh, built in 1969. Uh, it just celebrated its 50th birthday, which makes it uh, technically eligible for architectural preservation review. 50 years is apparently the official age for a building to become worthy of being a uh, of preservation review. And this is very important because despite the fact it's the last operating standalone movie theater in Thailand, the last operating standalone movie palace and one of the grandest movie palaces in Asia, if not the world, its future is unsecure. Uh, about in 2012, the landlord of the property, which is Chula Longkorn University, came out and uh, with a plan to redevelop most of Siam Square into a series of shopping malls. Um, and the Siam Theater, which was destroyed in 2010, during uh, the Red Shirt Riots, the Lido Theater, which is still standing and has been modified somewhat, and the Scala were all on the chopping block. Since then, there's been somewhat of an ad hoc uh, preservation movement, and Chula has seemingly backed off on their plans. They've given a series of lease extensions to Apex Theaters, which as far as I understand um, is relevant until 2021. After that, I don't know, and I don't know if anybody else knows. I've heard no good news. But I like to believe that it's gonna stay. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you, or maybe some of you are aware, the film archive of late has been um, programming classic films at the Scala once or twice a month. Uh, they've been doing this for about the past three years. Uh, I've seen The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly there. I've seen The Exorcist. I've seen Cleopatra, uh, a few others. They did Bruce Lee's The Big Boss. They did Pat Gao, which is a very famous uh, Thai movie known as The Scar in English. And this was at one such, one of these classic film screenings. And what the film archive has shown us is that with the right kind of programming, theaters like these can be not only fun and alive, but economically viable. It's an 800 plus seat theater, and at every screening I've been at during the, these, these, uh, these screenings, it's almost full. So I'm hoping that this will be the case. So I, I think in my uh, in the brochure for this or the the flyer for this talk, it says I would talk about Thailand's movie theaters and a little bit give a comparative study with Myanmar, which I've also done a lot of research in. So I'll very briefly before we end uh, do a little Myanmar Myanmar recap so you can see where things are in Thailand. So Thailand again, we've got these few remaining standalone movie theaters. Everything else is in shopping malls. In Myanmar, 
though the political and economic situation history, especially of the last 40, 50 years, has been very different than Thailand's. They have a lot of their old standalone movie theaters, which were built during the 50s and early 60s, and some earlier than that. Uh, when I first started going to Myanmar to document them in 2010, I was thrilled to find most of them actually still active, not the abandoned, uh, crumbling ruins that I would find throughout Thailand. Uh, ones like this one in the heart of Yangon, the Thamara, mid-century modern classic movie theaters, um, are showing films on a daily basis and have generally a very good draw. Um, up and down this one area of central Yangon on Sule Pagoda Road, there are a number of theaters. This one, the, uh, the Naypida, um, still in operation. A little further down, the, uh, the Shea Sound, originally known as the Lighthouse Cinema, also in operation. And these are beautiful, operational, mid-century movie palaces, or maybe you wouldn't call them palaces, but very, very elegant buildings. There's a number of reasons why they're still in operation in Myanmar. Um, obviously, the economy has been slower than Thailand over the years. There hasn't been the switch to a, uh, a car-based mode of transportation throughout most of the country until very recently, and even then it's not complete as it is in lots of parts of Thailand. So your old Myanmar cities, or your, your Myanmar cities tend to be very compact and centralized, and the old pre-car infrastructure is still basically intact, standalone movie theaters included. Um, this one's up in Mandalay, uh, still built in 1958, the Windlight Cinema, still operating, and, uh, very much alive. So you have this dynamic with the slowed economy. You also have a strange thing. There's actually a, a law on the books in Myanmar, I would say a somewhat dated law, but it's for, for my own interests, I'm very happy it exists. That if you demolish a movie theater, you have to rebuild a movie theater. Or whatever else you do build must contain a cinema in it. So this makes it makes a very big disincentive for a property owner to tear down a movie theater if they want to build something else because they can't unless it's got a movie theater in it. So rather than switch the entire movie theater, theater geography to the shopping mall variety or the multiplex variety, what's happening now in Myanmar is theater operators, a few companies, are going around the country and picking up old movie theaters, acquiring them, and renovating them. Uh, this was the case with a lot of these theaters that I just showed you. These were, um, they'd been seized by the government in the 1960s. By the 1990s, the government was selling off these assets, and uh, Mingala Cinemas, which is the biggest theater operator in Myanmar, they acquired these, these uh, buildings, and they've been operating them to this day. But they're going elsewhere. They're going also into secondary and tertiary markets trying to solidify their foothold in the movie exhibition industry. And I'm very happy to see that these beautiful mid-century movie theaters across the country, like this one in Mogok, are being renovated. Usually not in a good way. I wouldn't say they look better, but they're nonetheless, they, they, they keep the identity of place and the structure of the city. This one happens to be in the upland city of Mogok. Uh, the ruby capital of the world. Uh, one of the nicest settings I've ever seen a movie theater in. Anyhow, that concludes my talk. If you've got any questions, feel free to ask, and thank you all again for coming. <laughs> if you want to follow me on any of my social media, you know, this is a good way to follow my work. Thanks again. Well, thank you very much. Um, can I start with one question? I'm fascinated about the information you've gathered about Thai cinemas because it's not obvious. It's not written in books. You, I, I mean, how, how do you get the information about some of these places that have been abandoned or whatever? Maybe you could answer that. Sure. Uh, I've got to give credit where credit is due, actually. Some of it is written in books. Uh, River Books, the, the, the same publishing house that put out my book, Thailand's Movie Theaters, 
uh, in conjunction with the film archive, they put out a book um, a number of years ago, uh, maybe 10 years ago, called A Century of Thai Cinema. And I got a lot of my information on the early Thai movie theaters from that book and a few other books that the film archive has published uh, on the history of Thai film. Um, I also well, I found a graduate thesis from a Thai student studying somewhere in the U.S. in the 19, early 1980s or maybe early 1990s who actually studied the movie theaters of Thailand and what was being shown in Thai theaters. Tons of information, tons of information. Um, in fact, I learned from that thesis that Thailand really had one of the most diverse film fairs of any country, not only in the region, but any country I've, I've ever heard of. Thailand was getting movies not just from the major markets like Hong Kong and Singapore and Japan and Hollywood and France and England, but they were getting movies from Southeast Asian cinemas, or sorry, from Southeast Asian countries, from the Philippines, from Indonesia, Cambodia, a very little bit from Burma. They were getting movies from all over East Asia, from India, from Australia, from North Korea, from the Soviet Union. So this was Thailand 40 years ago. You, you had a very, very diverse screening array. Thanks for a really outstanding talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. My interest is um, small independent cinemas, like you're from Philly, so probably you're well acquainted with the Bryn Mawr Film Institute, which is on the larger side, the Roxy on Sansom Street that used to be, right? So I'm interested in what's happening here, and I haven't found very much. Uh, there's a Bangkok screening room. I think there, there may be one or two others. And I'm wondering if you know anything about that, either in a comparative perspective with Philly in terms of the owners and the developers, or anything more about these um, independent film international things that are small house deals. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Yes, as you mentioned, there, there is a, a bit of a movement going on here for alternate kinds of cinema spaces as opposed to the, uh, the multiplexes. Multiplexes, as you may know, basically just screen Hollywood blockbusters. Occasionally they screen some Thai cinema, but beyond that, not very much. Um, so yeah, you've got Bangkok Screening Room, you've got Cinema Oasis, you've got the Freeze Green Club, uh, you've got the Thai Film Archive, obviously. They're, they're based out in Salaya, but they also have this film series at, uh, at the Scala. Um, I know, I'm, I feel like I'm forgetting one or two. Oh, you've got RCA, or I'm sorry, House, which used to be down at RCA, and they've since now moved down to the Samyan area. In sum, I think what's happening right now is there's a movement to grow the film industry back to the illustrious times that we had 40, 50 years ago, when there was a great diversity of cinema owners and cinema content. And I think with these, these small players in the market. They're slowly rebuilding this market, and the eternal optimist in me hopes that as things go on, maybe this can move further afield outside of Bangkok. So I'd like to ask a question. Philip, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very good. How did they do translations for the audience? It's a great question. Uh, in a lot of Thai movie theaters, especially in the rural areas, um, the movies would be dubbed. And often, more often than not, the initial dubbing session would uh, entail having an actual live voice actor giving the voice, doing the, the voice of multiple characters in the film on hand. Uh, and this was this happened all over the country. In fact, in the, the f 60s, 70s, 80s, the dubbing, the uh, the art of dubbing became such a phenomenon, and developed to such a level that the dubber himself or herself would be the draw for the movie, more than the star or the director or anything like that. 
So these movie theater owners would go out of their way to book specific famous dubbers to come to their theater. And uh, yeah, that's basically how it worked in the rural areas. In some theaters, uh, in, in areas where there might be a, a, a highly educated class of people, or uh, maybe they were near the, mil the military bases that had US servicemen, you would have soundtrack rooms. And these were little rooms in the movie theater behind glass, separated from the rest of the seating in the, in the theater, where the original soundtrack for foreign films was piped in. So for instance, if it were a Hollywood movie, a, a Western, let's say, uh, the original dubbing soundtrack would have been in English. However, the Thai audience would have been hearing someone speaking Thai. But if you wanted to hear the original soundtrack, you would sit in this soundtrack room. They called them. Thanks, Phil. That was very interesting. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to go through every page of the book yet, but um, a, a few months ago I stumbled on the Prince Heritage Stay Hotel down on Jaron Nakon 46 or 48, I think. And uh, it gave me hope. It's a beautifully restored uh, hotel that used to be a movie theater. And I was wondering if you can sort of. It, it gave me hope that that sort of the, the people realizing the value in that film heritage might carry over maybe into the Scala and they would sort of realize what they have and even though it's not a working movie theater anymore, they've still retained the original facade and some of the original in interiors. So can you talk a little bit about that theater and maybe what it speaks to Thailand retain, getting more interested in preserving these old theaters? Yeah, good question. Yeah, the, the Prince Theater is in the... Uh, it's in the Bangrak Heritage Zone. So a few years ago, they had a, they created a master plan. Some uh, nonprofit organizations came together to try and preserve the old architecture down by the river, and they they identified key pieces. And the Prince Theater was one of them. Uh, the Prince Theater had been owned by the uh, by the Treasury Department uh, for years. It was operating kind of as a porno theater. And it closed in 2013 and was left to decay. Um, and so this, this group got together and they started a plan to, uh, yeah, to bring it back to life. There were several proposals, one of which was to turn it back into an actual functioning multi-use entertainment venue, movie theater, live shows, all that. Uh, ultimately, they were outbid by this uh, Prince Theater Heritage Stay, it's called. Um, they turned it into a guest house and uh, you know homestay type thing, but they actually did a phenomenal job of preserving the exterior, of preserving the screen, and to my knowledge now they're now actually supplementing their you know their their homestay services with uh, with movie screenings. So yeah, I, I definitely think there's an increasing eye in Thailand, especially in Bangkok for preserving these, uh, these classic, classic structures. There's another question. More questions than we're running out of time. Hello, um, I have two questions. The first is, why, why do they have that law in Burma that you have to, when you, when you, when you uh, get rid of a movie theater, you have to build a movie theater in its place? Just what's the reasoning behind that, the original reasoning? And the second unrelated question is, um, where, where, who sells the Thai posters and what kind of rough price do they tend to go for out of interest? Uh, to answer your first question, I don't know why that, the, why that law is on the books. My guess is it dates to the early days of the uh, junta in Myanmar and it was probably to ensure that uh, populations would always have something to do maybe a place for them to screen, you know, they can ensure that they can screen propaganda type stuff to, uh, to audiences. Uh, it's a, it seems like a, a very dated law and something that the junta there would, uh, would, would write. So I don't know the exact answer, but that's my guess. And the posters. And the posters. Uh, I collect, I sometimes sell. Uh, if you follow my Instagram, Thai Poster Bliss, I post my whole collection on there, and sometimes I sell them. But uh, if you want to be here in Bangkok, at Jatu Jack Market, just outside Jatu Jack Market, um, there's like an antique market uh, just to the south of, uh, of Jatu Jack. 
There's a couple of dealers there. Also, at the basement of Lido Theater, on the, or on the ground level, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny little shop called uh, Classic Movie Posters, and he sells stuff. Um, his prices are a little high because he's in the center of Bangkok, but he has good stuff. Hmm. One last question. I think there's someone else. Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I wanted to make a statement and ask a question. One was, what were ticket sale quantities like back in this time? Because when I started going to Thai theaters in the early 90s, some of them seemed to be bigger, have more seating than the town that they were in. You know, so I'm very curious, what was, and if the transition has something to do with TV, because I know that TV in other countries had a big effect on moviegoers. And then just my statement back to dubbing, that, that was something that was dying when I was first in Thailand, and I remember there being interviews in the newspaper, and one of the points that I thought was really interesting was, as the live dubbers did the film over and over again, they'd actually changed the story. Right, and I always have really regretted that people didn't go and record that because that's so interesting. You sort of think that a, a movie has to be fixed, but actually they would invent subplots and change the relationships and add all kinds of jokes and just make it kind of very Thai as they got bored with the original story. And I've always thought that must be kind of magical, actually, to see that kind of creativity go on. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, uh, in, in my book, I recorded one such story from southern Thailand, uh, a famous case. When the movie Serpico came to, uh, came to Thailand, it made it to this theater in, in Nakhon Si Tamarat, and there was a very famous local dubber there. And he was, uh, he, he, he was much loved. Anyhow, he took the story of Serpico, which is about police corruption and a New York City, a straight-laced New York City cop fighting back against a corrupt police bureaucracy. Well, when this particular dubber gave, the, vo uh, gave the, the plot to this story, he changed the names of the characters to meet the names of the actual cops in that town who are known for being, who are known for being corrupt. Uh, it was a huge sensation. He, uh, and he ended up getting uh, sued in libel court and uh, then went on to become a politician in his own right. And he, was, he was a hero. Um, but yeah, so that it was a. Uh, I, I would love to hear more stories like that. Um, uh, and your first question about the numbers of. I went to so many movie theaters that it really seemed like there were more seats in it than there were people in the town. And I was very curious about when it was and what was happening. Because I think that was the thing that was so many people went to films and when the transition was. Because when I would go to them, they'd be happy. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, that's, an, that's actually an interesting question. No one's ever asked that before. The answer is, is quite simple. A lot of these theaters, if they were in a maybe a somewhat bustling market town somewhere in rural rural part of the country, uh, they would send out buses and rope dangs and other vehicles to go around to surrounding villages and pick people up and bring them in. And oftentimes they would have not just capacity crowds, but spillover crowds. And they would bring out folding seats uh, to accommodate these crowds. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's one thing that happened. Thank you, thank you very much, Philip. It was a very interesting, entertaining. We didn't see a movie, but we so, right? enjoyed your talk very, very much. Um, so thank you, everyone.